Yes, uh, very good morning. How are all of you? How is audit? <laughs> yes, have you finished the first reading of the entire subject? Do you know all the chapters which are there in the subject? Okay, so you've come for an amendment batch. 120 pages RTP. Does it look scary? Right, 120 pages. I think out of that, the majority of it has been picked up by the GST. And not the GST R 9C. And plus you look at the MCQs of the institute. Right, big case studies. You know, earlier you thought, oh, 30 marks MCQ. But tabhi lagta hai ki, yaar, to read this also will take a lot of time in the exam. And not to read the content. And for some MCQs, you can probably read only the last line first, you know, to see what are they exactly asking. Like there is the second MCQ where they are asking, okay, they want to know that for how many years audit documentation is required to be maintained. And then there are options, no, seven years, eight years, ten years, five years, something. Right, so seven years it is required to be kept. Okay, right, so coming to the amendments, one, we'll go to the amendments under the fiscal laws. Right, one, the amendments in the tax audit, that is in the form 3CD, and second one, the GST audit. Right, so form 3CD, now in total there are 44 clauses over there. Right, very old, it had 32 clauses. Then after that, it had the 41 clauses. And now we have the 44 clauses. Right, so clause 4 of form 3CD. Right, clause 4 of form 3CD, which is regarding the whether the assessee is liable to pay any indirect taxes. Right, and any registration number, any identification number allotted for the same. So now what is the registration identification number which could be allotted also? It could be the GST registration number, what we call it as the GSTIN. Right, the GSTIN. So if I come to the RTP May 19, right, if I come to the RTP May 19, if I come to the amendments in Form 3CD, what does it say? Details as to indirect tax registration. Right? So the registration number or the GST number or any other identification number allotted for the same. And in the exams, already once a question has been asked regarding clause 4 of form 3CD. Right? So if I just take you to that particular question of form 3CD. Right? Just give me a moment. Okay. Right, there is a question which has been asked in your exams in the past, which is regarding Mr. Dipesh. Right, Mr. Dipesh is a renowned criminal lawyer practicing in Meerut. Right, during the previous year, he collected service tax of 25 lakh, but utilized for personal use. The Commissioner of Central Excise issued a show cause notice to him as to why the tax collected by him is not deposited to the government account. Yes, he appeared before the Commissioner and stated his inability to pay the sum due to a financial crisis. The proceedings are still pending before the Commissioner. Right, so reporting requirement under Clause 4 of Form 3C D. Right, then first they have given the facts of the case. Right, so in a tax audit answer, what do you need to do? Write the reporting requirement under which clause and then write down the facts of the case. Then after that, you need to write down the provisions and explanation. Right, then the provisions and explanation. What is the provision? A tax auditor is required to report under clause 4 of form 3CD. Like you write, you know, clause 1 of part 2 of first schedule, second schedule. So your clause 4 of form 3C D, which requires him to mention the registration number or any other identification number, if any allotted, including the GST number, if any, right, in case if the assessee is liable to pay any indirect taxes, right. So this is the reporting requirement. Then to report on this, what audit procedures are required to be followed, right. So this is the green part. Right, part A, up to clause 8, it is part A of form 3CD, generally requires the auditor to give the factual details of the assessee. Thus, the auditor is primarily required to furnish the details of the registration number as provided to him by the assessee. Serial number, relevant indirect tax law which is applicable, place of business and the registration or the identification number. The auditor has to keep in mind the provisions of SA 580, written representations, right? So he has to obtain a representation from the management that for all indirect taxes that they are liable to pay, they've obtained the registration number for the same, 
Right. In case the auditor is prima facie of the opinion that indirect tax law is applicable on the business or profession, but the SSE is not registered under the said law, the auditor should report the same appropriately. And then you have the conclusion. Therefore, the tax auditor of Mr. Dipesh is required to furnish the service tax, GST, whatever registration number under clause 4 of form 3CD. Right, so did you also notice the format of the answer? It starts with the facts of the case, reporting requirements under clause 4 of form 3CD in the given case. Then provisions and explanation. Provisions and explanation, two part. One, what is the clause? What is the reporting requirement? And then to do the reporting, what audit procedure will you perform? Right, what are the audit procedures to be performed? And then after that you give a conclusion. Right, so facts of the case, then provisions and explanation and then you have the conclusion. I hope you understand. Right, so clause 4. So question has been asked previously. Right, May 2016. Right, the indirect tax and the registration number. Right, then after that there is an amendment in clause 19. Right, after clause 4, where is the next amendment? The next amendment is in clause 19 of form 3CD. Right, clause 19, now in the list of weighted deductions. Now in the list of weighted deductions over there, they have also added section 32 AD. Right, section 32 AD which is regarding the investment allowance. Right, where you get a weighted deduction. Right, so 32 AD, that is clause 19 of form 3CD. Right, that is clause 19 of form 3CD. Okay, so if I come to amounts admissible under section, what has happened over there? Now all these 32 sections were already there. Now what is added in the list is 32 AD. Right, so 32 AC, AD, AB, ABA, 33, 35 and all these scientific research from pharmaceutical industries. So now what is added over there is 32 AD which is regarding the investment allowance. Right, where you get a weighted deduction. Right, so clause 4, there is an amendment, GST registration number, clause 19, 32 AD added over there. Then after that directly coming to clause 29A and 29B. Right, there is clause 29 also. What is 29? Received consideration for issue of shares which exceeds the fair market value of a company in which the public are not substantially interested. Right, you have to clause 28 and 29. 28 received shares without consideration or inadequate consideration and 29 received consideration for issue of shares which exceeds the fair market value. It says income from other sources under 56 to 7A and income from other sources under 56 to 7B. Right, that is clause 28 of form 3CD and clause 29 of form 3CD. Both of this we have seen questions in RTP and suggested. Right, in the subject, RTP they put question on 29, exam they ask 28 and again they ask 29. Right, so clause 28 and 29. Now 29A talks about the income from other sources under 56 to 9 and 29B talks about income from other sources under 56 to 10. Right, 56 to 9 and 56 to 10. 56 to 9. Okay, I wanted to sell an asset to you. Okay, say any land building, any immovable property or any plant and machinery property plant. Right, I wanted to sell an asset to you. Okay, so you gave me an advance. Okay, that someday later I will transfer an asset to you. So you get capital asset. So you gave me an advance of 30 lakh. Okay, due to some reason the sale could not take place. Okay, if I return back the advance to you, no problem. And sale was going to take place, so you gave me an advance of 30 lakh and now say due to some reason the sale is not going to take place and I don't even return the advance, I forfeit the advance. And a forfeiture of advance received for the transfer of a capital asset now has to be shown as income under 5629 as income from other sources. Right, R raised to 10, revise, read, revise 10 times before the exam. Very much a possibility of a case study coming in the exam from this one. And a forfeiture of advance received towards the transfer of a capital asset. I hope you understand what I say. Forfeiture of an 
advance received for the transfer of a capital asset what is 29a whether any amount is to be included as income chargeable under the head income from other sources as referred to under 56 to 9 if yes please furnish the detail the nature of income and the amount thereof right the nature of income and the amount thereof right so for feature of advances Right, in respect of the as advances received and assets not transferred, the tax auditor should refer to the terms of the contract. Okay, so the tax auditor, you can copy down this sentence. The tax auditor should therefore obtain a certificate from the assessee. This is the audit procedure. Right, regarding all such advances received towards the transfer of the capital asset which have been forfeited during the year. Did you see that sentence? Right, what is the sentence? The tax auditor should therefore obtain a certificate from the SSE regarding all such advances received towards the transfer of the capital asset which have been forfeited during the year. I just give you that example. You gave me an advance and the transfer could not take place. And if I do the forfeiture of that advance, then that has to be shown as income from other sources under 56 to 9. Copy down the sentence. Right, copy down this sentence. This is in the guidance note for tax audit issued by ICAI. Did everybody understand 5629 income from other sources? Right, transfer of capital, transfer of capital asset, the advance received has been forfeited because the sale transfer has not taken place. Right? The tax auditor should therefore obtain a certificate from the assessee regarding all such advances received towards the transfer of the capital assets which have been forfeited during the year. Then it says the advance might have been received during the previous year or earlier for the purpose of this clause, the previous year in which the forfeiture which takes place is relevant. Have you copied down? Advances received towards the transfer of capital assets which have been forfeited during the year. Okay. Right, then after that you have 29B which is regarding 56 to 10. What is 56 to 10? Gifts received in excess of 50,000 or which where it exceeds 105% of the stamp value. Again that is to be shown as income from other sources under 56 to 10 and that comes under 29B. Right, so income from other sources, gifts received in excess of 50,000. Right, so again 29B. Whether any amount is to be included as income chargeable under the head income from other sources as referred to in clause 56 to 10. If yes, please furnish the detail, the nature of the income and the amount in rupees thereof. Right, so new clause 29B has been introduced for 56 to 10. Right, then what does it say? Gives in excess of any sum received without consideration if it exceeds 50,000. Or the stamp duty value which exceeds 50,000 or 105% of the stamp duty value. Therefore, for any movable property where the stamp value is up to 105% of the sale consideration, no addition can be made. But if it exceeds 105%, then it is to be treated as income from other sources. Right? So 28, 56 to 7 A, 29, 56 to 7 B, 29 A, 56 to 9, and 29 B, 56 to 10. All 56 income from other sources, right? 56 too is all income from the other sources, right? Then I come to clause 30, right? What is the original clause 30? Amount borrowed on any hundi, right? Other than by account pay check or account pay draft. But now what is the amendment over there? There are three clauses added, 30A, 30B and 30C, right? 30A, 30B and the 30C. Right, 30C is regarding the impermissible avoidance arrangement. 30C is regarding the impermissible avoidance arrangement. Right, it is regarding the impermissible avoidance arrangement. But anyways, the applicability of this clause has been deferred till 1st of April 2019. But they have given it over there. Right, this 30C and 44, these have been deferred till 1st of April 2019. 
30C and later on I'll show you clause 44 and which has also been deferred. So now looking into 30A and 30B. Okay, say I have purchased some goods from an associated enterprise outside India. I have purchased some goods from an associated enterprise outside India. Okay, the fair market value of those goods is 100 crore. But I have purchased the goods from the associated enterprise at 120 crore. I have purchased the goods from the associated enterprise at 120 crore. Okay, so now had it not been an associated enterprise, at what price I would have purchased it? 100 crore. Okay, so right now I have made a payment outside India of 120 crore. 20 crore is the excess payment that I have made outside India. So it says whether this 20 crore is called as the primary adjustment. So it says whether there is any primary adjustment required under clause of section 92 CE of the Income Tax Act which is the transfer pricing, right, then whether the excess money has been repatriated to India, whether the excess money has been repatriated to India, whether it has been repatriated to India within the prescribed time limit. What is the prescribed time limit? 90 days. Whether the excess money has been repatriated to India within the prescribed time limit and if it has not been repatriated to India within the prescribed time limit then what is the imputed interest income on such money which is yet to be received from outside India. Right that is 30A. Right that is clause 30A. Right so 19 we have seen then we see 29A, 29B. Right and now coming to 30A. Whether primary adjustment to transfer price, I told you in my example how much is the amount of the adjustment, 20 crore, right, as referred to in subsection 1 of section 92 C, CE has been made during the previous year, if yes, please furnish the detail, under which clause of subsection 1 of section 92 CE, how much is the amount of primary adjustment, in my example it is 20 crore, whether the excess money available with the associate enterprise is required to be repatriated to India as per the provision. So what is the adjustment, whether the excess money is required to be repatriated to India, whether the excess money has been repatriated within the prescribed time, what is the prescribed time? 90 days and if no, it has not been repatriated to India, then the amount of imputed interest income on such excess money which has not been repatriated within the prescribed time. Right, so that is section clause 30A regarding the primary adjustment under section 92 CE of the Income Tax Act. Right, whether there is any primary adjustment under which clause? What is the amount of primary adjustment, then whether the excess money is required to be repatriated, then whether it has been repatriated within the prescribed time and if not then what is the imputed interest income, right. And if not then what is the imputed interest income on such excess money which has not been repatriated within the prescribed time. Right, no secondary adjustment is required if the amount of primary adjustment made in any previous year does not exceed 1 crore. So if the exam, the question is 75 lakh, 85 lakh, then this clause reporting will not be applicable. That is why I have taken an example of 20 crore. And in excess of 1 crore, only then the adjustment and the amount is required to be repatriated to India. Right, then the amount is required to be repatriated to India. Right, 30A. Then 30B is regarding the limitation on interest deduction. Right, what we have seen right now is 30A which is regarding the primary adjustment. So you can guess what is 30A? It is regarding the primary adjustment. Right, 30B is regarding the limitation on interest deduction. Right, limitation on the interest deduction. Right, limitation on the interest deduction. Okay, so say the interest expenditure for of the company for the current year is say 150 crore, just as an example. The interest expenditure of the company for the current year is 150 crore and say they are EBITDA, you know, earnings before interest tax depreciation, right, say that is 400 crore. How much is the interest expenditure? 150 crore and how much is the EBITDA of the company? 400 crore. Okay, so let us see over here 30B limitation on interest deduction 
whether the assessee has incurred expenditure during the previous year by way of interest or of similar nature again exceeding 1 crore rupees. Right. So again what does it say? Exceeding 1 crore. Even primary adjustment what did it say? Exceeding 1 crore. Even limitation on interest deduction if it is exceeding 1 crore. Right. Then what does it say? Please furnish the following detail. Amount of expenditure by way of interest or of similar nature. In my example, how much is the amount of interest expenditure? 150 crore. Earnings before, you know, the EBITDA. So, how much is the EBITDA in my example? 400 crore. Calculate the third number and tell me. Right? Amount of expenditure by way of interest or similar nature as per 1 above, which exceeds 30% of the EBITDA as per 2 above. Thirty-seven point five percent. Amount in rupees of expenditure, rupees me chahiye, not in percentage. Right of expenditure by way of interest as per one above, which exceeds thirty percent of EBITDA. How much is thirty percent of EBITDA? One twenty crore. What is the amount of interest expenditure? One fifty crore. So one fifty minus one twenty. Right, what is 120 from where did it come? 400 into 30 percent. Right, 400 into 30 percent that gave us 120 crore. So, how much it is? 30 crore. Right, which exceeds what exceeds above one is yes, more than 120 crore. It says that 30 crore you will have to carry forward it in the broad, bring it forward in the further years. Why? Because there is a limitation on interest deduction. Okay, up to 30% of EBITDA, you can take the debit interest charge in the current year. Beyond that, you can carry forward. Right? You can carry forward. So, details of interest expenditure brought forward as per subsection 4 of section 94B and details of ex interest expenditure carried forward. Right? So, brought forward and also carried forward. Why? Because there is a limitation on interest deduction. How much interest deduction is allowed in one year? 30% of EBITDA. Anything in excess of that, you will have to carry it forward. Do you understand that? Limitation on interest deduction. Right? And then after that, you have 30C, which is regarding the impermissible avoidance arrangement. Right? 30C, which is regarding the impermissible avoidance arrangement. But again, what is said? That the applicability of 30C has been deferred till April 1, 2019. Right, impermissible avoidance agreement. So 30A, 30B and 30C. Is it clear to everyone? 30A, 30B and 30C. Right, this is RTP May 19 old course and RTP May 19 new course all amendments are covered. You know, May 19 old course has more amendments. Why? Because now they don't want to update the module. And also that basic elements of PSU audit and a financial audit, compliance audit. Okay, since November 2017, it is there in the RTP only. You understand, you see, you know, the basic elements of PSU audits, the three parties, auditor, responsible party and the intended users. Then the subject matter criteria and the subject matter information and the type of engagement, whether it is an attestation engagement or whether it is a reporting engagement. Right, so all that is already there. So RTP old course is more inclusive. So when I cover the old course RTP, obviously I've also covered the new course RTP. Okay, right, and it's all applicable for both. Right, so 30A, 30B and 30C. What is 30A? Primary adjustment. 30B, limitation on interest deduction. 30C, impermissible avoidance arrangement. Then now coming to 31. Right, clause 31 is so huge, no? Because you have 31 A, B, C, D, E and under B you also have B, A, B, 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 C and B, D. And also 31 A, 31 B, 31 B, A, 31 B, 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 C, B, D, 31 C, 31 D and 31 E. Full variety. Okay, right. Yes, so let us quickly see. So the amendment is mainly in B, A, B, 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 C, B, D. Okay, pay attention, right? 31A and 31B is regarding the, if the assessee has accepted any loan or deposit in excess of rupees 20,000 other than by account pay check or account pay draft. So whether it has been taken by check or draft and if it is a check or draft, then whether it is an account pay check or an account pay draft. 
है ना लोन डिपॉजिट और स्पेसिफाइड सम वेदर इट इन एक्सेस ऑफ ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड वेदर इट हैज बीन एक्सेप्टेड बाय अदर देन अकाउंट पे चेक और अकाउंट पे ड्राफ्ट देन यू हैव टू गिव द नेम एड्रेस एंड पैन द अमाउंट ऑफ लोन और डिपॉजिट द अमाउंट स्क्वायर ऑफ ड्यूरिंग द ईयर द मैक्सिमम अमाउंट आउटस्टैंडिंग एट एनी पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम ड्यूरिंग द ईयर right then whether it was accepted by check draft or ecs and if it was check or draft then whether it is an account pay check or an account pay draft right 31a is regarding accepting loan or deposit and 31b is regarding accepting a specified sum 31c is regarding the repayment and now whether the repayment of the loan deposit or the specified sum has been done during the previous year right again name address and pan the amount of repayment whether it has been repaid by check draft or ecs and if it is check or draft then whether it is an account pay check or an account pay draft 31d it says tell us the details of repayment of those loans which you had originally accepted in cash okay during the previous year you have repaid a loan but ye jo loan aapne previous year mein repay kiya hai ye originally aapne cash mein accept kiya tha So 31D repayment of those loans which you had originally accepted in cash, and 31E repayment of those loans which you had originally accepted by check or draft, which was not an account pay check or an account pay draft. Right. So 31A B acceptance, acceptance of loan deposit or the specified sum, and 31C repayment of all loans or deposits or specified sum. 31D repayment of those loans which you had originally accepted in cash. And 31E repayment of those loans which were originally accepted by check or draft, which is not an account pay check or an account pay draft. Right now, coming to BA, BB, BC, and BD. Is it right? Now we will come to 31. So I'll just go to the next page. Okay, 31 BA, BB, BC, and BD. Right, clause 31. I'm talking about BA, BB, BC, and the BD. right b a b b b b is regarding the receipts right and b c b d is regarding the payments right what does it say the receipts from a single person for in a single day right for a single transaction or for many transactions but relating to a single event or occasion has been made in cash or has been made by check or draft which is not an account pay check or an account pay draft in excess of right receipts in excess of 2 lakh right receipts in excess of 2 lakh and payments in excess of 2 lakh to a person in a day for a single transaction or many transactions relating to one event or occasion right then what does it say name address and pan what details do we want if the receipt has been in cash Okay, so say there is an event management company, and an event management company they have received the money from a person say for organizing a birthday party four lakh rupees in cash. So now that event management company when their tax audit form three C D is filled, here the details have to be given, right? The name, address, pan, the nature of the transaction, the amount involved, and also the date of the receipt. right the amount involved and also the date of the receipt if more than 10 a uh, 2 lakh rupees have been received in cash if more than 2 lakh rupees have been received in cash right more than 2 lakh received rupees have been received by check or draft which is not an account pay check or an draft then name address pan and the amount then it says we don't want the nature and the date if it is in cash to fir to hame nature or date bhi chahiye If it is cash, then we want the nature of the transaction also and the amount date of receipt also. But if it is by check or draft, which is not an account pay check or an account pay draft, then name, address, pan, and the amount and payment. Now the event management company has received the payment, uh, received the money. But obviously some party, some person, जिनके यहाँ birthday party था, उन्होंने payment किया होगा. Right. So this was part A. I told you it's in the books of the event management company. Part B say in the books of the company of which have made the payment in their form three C D. So again, if the payment has been made in cash, what details is required? Name, address, and pan. Right. Name, address, and pan of the pay. Right. Then after that, the nature of the transaction. Then the amount of the payment and the date of the payment. 
and if it is by check or draft then we only want name address and pan and the amount of the payment right then no nature and date required right then no nature and date required right so that is ba bb bc and bd right receipts in excess of 2 lakh and payments in excess of 2 lakh right receipts in excess of 2 lakh and payments in excess of 2 lakh Right, 31 A, B, C, D, E is regarding loan or deposit accepted or repaid of more than 20,000 other than by account pay check or account pay draft. And 31 B, A, B, 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 C, B, D is regarding receipts and payment of more than 2 lakh other than by check or draft or check or draft which is not an account pay check or an account pay draft. So receipts and payments in cash or receipts and payments in check or draft which is not an account pay check or an account pay draft. I hope it is clear to you, right? 31 BA, BB, right? Then BC and BD, right? So 31 A, B, C, D, E, that is one story. And 31 AB is what? Loan or deposit or specified sum accepted, right? By a check, draft, or ECS. And if it is a check or draft, whether it is an account pay check or an account pay draft. 31 B also specified sum, right? Then coming to BA. What is BA? Particulars of each receipt in an amount exceeding the limit specified in section 269 ST. What is the limit specified? 2 lakh. In aggregate from a person in a day in respect of a single transaction or in respect of transactions relating to one event or occasion from a person during the previous year where such receipt is otherwise than by check, draft or ECS through a bank account. What detail, name, address and PAN, nature of the transaction, the amount of receipt and the date of receipt. Right, and what does it say? <clears throat> right, if it is by check or if it is by received by check or draft, not being an account pay check or an account pay draft, then only two details, name, address and PAN and the amount of the receipt. Then nature and date is not required. Right, and BC is regarding the payments in cash. What does it say? Name, address, PAN, nature of the transaction, amount of payment and the date of payment. Right? And if it is by check draft, not being an account pay check or an account pay draft, 31 BD, then name, address and PAN and the amount of payment. Right? Then the nature and date is not required. I hope it is clear. Everybody understands what I say? Right? BA, BB, BC and BD. Receipts and payments in excess of 2 lakh other than by check or draft other than by check or draft and if it is check or draft other than by account pay check or account pay draft that is receipts or payments in cash or receipts and payments by check or draft in excess of 2 lakh rupees from a person in a single day in respect of a single transaction or multiple transactions relating to one event or occasion right receipts and payments right so that is 31 right that's the amendment in clause 31 of form 3c d Next amendment in is in clause 36 of form 3CD, right, clause 36A and a clause 36 is what? The tax on distributed profits and a dividend distribution tax, right, what is clause 36? It is regarding the DDT, the dividend distribution tax, right, and 36A is regarding the dividend of the closely held company. And the company is received the dividend of a closely held company as mentioned under section 2, subsection 2, clause E, 222E. Right, so that is added over there, clause 36A, dividend of a closely held company. Right, so that's the addition. Right, then after 36, directly, that is the next one is clause 42. Right, next one is clause 42. Right, so if you look over here, you have 31 BD and then after 31 BD, 31 C, 31 D, 31 E and then directly 36 A. Whether the SSE has received any amount in the nature of dividend. Right, so received any dividend in as referred to in 222 E. If yes, please furnish the details. Right, so the tax auditor should obtain from the taxpayer a certificate containing a list of all the closely held companies in which the beneficial owner is carrying not less than 10% of the voting power. The tax auditor should obtain a certificate from the taxpayer giving particulars of any loans or advances received by any concern in which he has a substantial interest from any closely held company. These certificates are necessary since the tax auditor may not be able to verify these from the books of account of the taxpayer. 
right so this is all the detailing part of it right but that is 36a which is regarding the dividend from a closely held company referred to in 222a then you have 42 43 and 44 okay now i want to enter into a transaction with a person for an amount of 3 lakh as an example i want to enter into an, a transaction with a person for an amount of 3 lakh now the amount of the transaction is more than 2 lakh so pan is required so I tell that other person, please give me your PAN. He says, I don't have PAN. If he does not have PAN, then he will give me a declaration in Form 60. Okay, now I am a person who is a receiver of Form 60. I have entered into a transaction with a person who has not quoted the PAN. That is why that person has given me a declaration in Form 60. And the receiver of Form 60 has to file Form 61. Right, receiver of form 60 is required to file form 61. So form 61, then we have form 61A and then we have the form 61B. What is 61? Receiver of form 60 is required to file form 61. Receiver of form 60 and who gives form 60? A person who does not quote the PAN. Right, 61A is regarding the specified financial transaction. So whether any specified financial transactions have been entered during the previous year like buyback of shares or so, there is a huge list given over there. Right and 61B is regarding the FATCA, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. Right, it is regarding the FATCA, right, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. 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 So, where the, where the assessee is required to file Form 61, 61A, 61B, whether these have been punished by the assessee or not, is what is required to be reported under Clause 42. Okay, what was the due date? What was the actual date of furnishing? Right, all these can come in the exam under MCQs. Right? They can ask multiple choice questions for these ones. Right? So where the assessee is required to furnish statements in form 61, 61A or 61B. Yes, then please furnish. Whether he is required to furnish these statements, then yes, serial number, income tax department, reporting entity, identification number, type of form 61, 61A, 61B. Due date for furnishing, the date of furnishing, if furnished. Whether the form contains the information about all the transactions which are required to be reported. And if not, please furnish the details of the transactions which are not reported. Right, so any transactions which have been reported in that 61, 61A, 61B, if it has not been reported, then that the tax auditor is required to do the report. Right, so 42 is regarding 61, 61A and the 61B. Right, 61, 61A and the 61B. Right, what did I say with respect to form 61? The tax auditor should verify whether the taxpayer has entered into any transaction where the other party was required to quote the PAN. He should verify whether the taxpayer has obtained the declaration in Form 60 where the other party has not furnished the PAN. Right? So, receiver of Form 60 is required to file Form 61. Right? Then 61A is regarding the specified financial transactions referred to under Section 285BA of the Income Tax Act. Right, the specified financial transactions. Right, it is regarding the specified financial transactions. Right, so you know, if I come to this guidance note issued by ICAI regarding the amendments in Form 3CD, right, it says after serial number 41, the following shall be inserted, namely 42. Right, 41, Form 61A, Form 61, and then after that 61A. Right, 61A is regarding under section 285BA. Right, an assessee and certain other persons are required to give the details of the financial transaction. So, what did I tell you? It is mainly for the specified financial transactions. And what does it say? These are the examples of the transaction. And so, specified financial transaction, there is such a big list of examples over there. Right, the nature and value of transaction and the class of person. Payments made in cash for purchase of bank drafts or pay orders. Cash deposits aggregating to 10 lakh rupees or more. One or more time deposits of persons exceeding 10 lakh rupees. 
payments made to a person aggregating 1 lakh rupees or more in cash right these are all these specified financial transaction right a company issuing shares a receipt from any person for an amount aggregating 10 lakh rupees or more in a financial year for acquiring shares issued by a company buyback of shares from any person for an amount exceeding 10 lakh rupees right receipt from any person for an amount exceeding 10 lakh receipt from any person for sale of foreign currency including any credit again an amount exceeding 10 lakh rupees or more right which document am i right now at right which document am i right now at implementation guide right so this you get it on the ICI website right with respect to notification dated so all the amendments in form 3cd are discussed over here okay so specified financial transactions those are the specified financial transaction and 61b i told you the patka right the foreign account tax compliance act right then you have clause 43 right clause 43 is also talking about a report right clause 43 is also talking about a report the country by country report right so where the assessee is required to file the cbcr the country by country report again whether the same has been filed right name of ultimate parent company the ultimate reporting entity Right, so whether the assessee or its parent entity or the alternate reporting entity is liable to furnish the report. What is the report called as CBCR, the country by country report, as referred to in section 286 of the Income Tax Act. Right, so everywhere now 42, 43, they are asking that whatever forms and reports are required to be furnished, whether they have been furnished or not. If yes, then please furnish the detail whether the report has been furnished by the assessee or its parent entity or the alternate reporting entity name of parent entity name of alternate reporting entity and the date of furnishing the report right and the date of furnishing the report right so that is clause 43 right clause 43 is regarding the cbcr the country by country report and then you have clause 44 which is regarding the breakup of the total expenditure whether or not the assessee is registered under the gst law breakup of the total expenditure whether or not the assessee is registered under the gst law right so again applicability of clause 44 has been deferred till 1st april 2019 one I told you 30C which is regarding the impermissible avoidance arrangement and second one is the clause 44. Right, breakup of the total expenditure of entities registered or not registered under GST. So all, serial number, total amount of expenditure, expenditure in respect of entities registered under GST and expenditure in respect of other ent entities registered under GST for expenditure. Right, and these are the details of the expenditure. So, breakup of total expenditure and applicability of clause 44 is deferred till April 1, 2009. Right, is it clear to everyone? So, can we again once make a summary of the clauses where there is an amendment? Right, clause 4, which is regarding GST registration number. Then you have clause 19, 32 AD, investment allowance. Then 29A, 56 to 9 and 29B, 56 to 10. Then 30A, primary adjustment. 30B, limitation on interest deduction. 30C, impermissible avoidance arrangement. Then 31, BA, BB, BC and BD. Right, receipts and payments in excess of 2 lakh rupees. Right, then 36A which is regarding the dividends of a closely held company referred to in section 222E. Then 42 form 61, 61A and 61B. 43 is country by country report and 44 is the total expenditure, the breakup of the total expenditure. I hope that is clear to everyone, right, the breakup of the total expenditure. Okay, these questions are also there in the previous RTP, but because they are regarding the applicability of section 44 AD, we'll just quickly see these questions. Right, these were there in the previous RTP also. Right, applicability of tax audit. DB Private Limited has a turnover of 125 lakh for 1890. No, 44 AD is not applicable to company assessee. Yes, and hence limit of 2 crore is not applicable to DB private limited. Under section 44 AD, what is the limit? 2 crore. 
है ना दे कैन पे द टैक्स ऑन प्रेजेंटिव बेसिस राइट इस एंड इट हैज टू कंडक्ट द ऑडिट ऑफ द बुक्स ऑफ अकाउंट अंडर सेक्शन 44 ए बी एस द टर्न ओवर एक्सीड्स वन क्रो राइट सेकंड क्वेश्चन ओवर देर ए बी सी एंड कंपनी अ पार्टनरशिप फॉर्म so to app section 44 ad applicable engaged in trading of electronic goods having a turnover of 165 lakh so what does it say section 44 ad is applicable to a partnership firm this abc and company can declare minimum profit at the rate of 8% of the turnover as the turnover does not exceed 2 crore if the firm does not opt for presumptive income right then under section 44 ad then it has to get its books of accounts audited under section 44 ab Next one, Anand Khatter, a commission agent, has commission receipts of one thirty-seven lakh. Now, though Section forty-four AD is applicable to individual and firm, but it is not applicable to commission income. Those section, are you all with me? Those section forty-four AD is applicable to an individual. It is not applicable to commission income. In the given case, Anand earns the commission income. He cannot take the benefit of Section 44 AD. His turnover in respect of commission income exceeds one crore, and he has to get his accounts audited under Section 44 AB. Right? Then Vishal Raka, owning an agency of Samsung Mobile for the city of Pune, and makes commission to, uh, makes the turnover of 87 lakh. So individual again the benefit available but commission income not available but here it is anyways below one crore so no audit required under section forty four A B of the Act also. Right everybody do you understand forty four A D applicable to individual form but in that also not applicable to the commission income. What does it say? Limit is two crore and they can pay presumptive income is under eight percent of the turnover. Is it clear to everyone? Okay. Right then, now coming to the second one, GST audit. Right now, coming to the second one, which is regarding the GST audit. Right, so let us again go through all what they are trying to say about GST. They start with the definition of audit under the GST law. <clears throat> right, the second part, which is regarding the GST audit. Right, they start with the definition of audit under the GST law. Now, under tax audit, we refer to the person as the assessee. Under GST audit, we'll refer to him as the registered person. Right? We'll refer to him as the registered person. So, what does it say? Audit means the examination of records, documents, right? Other records, documents, and the other documents, records, returns, and the other documents maintained or furnished by the registered person under the provisions of this act or any other law for the time being in force to verify the correctness of so why are you examining the records documents and return to verify the correctness of the turnover declared the taxes paid the refund claim and the input tax credit availed and also to assess compliance with the provisions of the act and the rules made there under Right. So, what is the definition of audit under the GST law? Right. Audit means the examination of the records to verify the correctness of turnover declared, taxes paid, refund claim, and input tax credit availed, and also to assess its compliance with the provisions of this Act or the rules made there under. Clear to everyone? Turnover. to verify the correctness of the turnover declared taxes paid input tax credit availed refund claim on compliance with the provisions of the act or the rules okay right so that's the definition types of audit under the gst law one is the audit by the professionals where the aggregate turnover of the assess of the registered person exceeds 2 crore Right, one is the audit by the professionals, where the aggregate turnover of the registered person exceeds two crore. And what is included in the aggregate turnover? Right, the taxable supplies, the exempt supplies, the interstate supplies, and also the exports. And what is excluded? SGST, CGST, IGST, UTGST, and the CES. Right, while calculating the aggregate turnover of two crore. so for all those registered person whose aggregate turnover exceeds 2 crore have to get their accounts audited under the gst law by a ca or a cma right second one is the general audit under the gst law so first audit is the audit by the professional and now next two audits are the audits by the tax authorities one is the general audit 
right where the commissioner can authorize he can do the audit under the gst law and third one is the special audit under the gst law which is r raised to 10 which i expect to be a retail question in your exams then a special audit under the gst law i think this is also there previously there is no addition over here right what are the circumstances when a special audit would be required under the gst law when the gst authorities think that one the value has not been correctly declared or the credit availed is not within the normal limits right so value has not been correctly declared or the credit availed is not within the normal limits right what does it say these are the circumstances for directing a special audit under the gst law right when the is of the opinion that the value has not been correctly declared or the credit availed is not within the normal limit at what point of time the special audit can be called for it says after commencement and before completion look at the wording after commencement and before completion of any scrutiny inquiry investigation or any of the proceedings under the act So at what stage the GST audit? I mean, under GST there is some scrutiny going on, or investigation going on of the assessee, of the registered person, or any proceedings going on against the registered person. At that stage, and after commencement and before completion of any scrutiny, inquiry, investigation, or any other proceedings under the Act, may direct a registered person to get his books of accounts audited by an expert. Who is going to be the expert? The CA or the CMA. the report has to be submitted within 90 days that 90 days can be further extended by more 90 days and the expenses of the special audit will be determined and borne by the commission right so very important you have to remember what are the circumstances value has not been correctly declared or the credit availed is not within the normal limits right and after commencement and before completion of any scrutiny inquiry investigation or any other proceedings under the act may direct a registered person to get his books of accounts audited by an expert right is it clear to everyone right preparation for gst audit again r raised to 10 you know old course of where you had vat audit even for the new course students you know earlier before gst audit you had vat audit in vat audit also there was a question called as preparation for vat audit and you know the program approach to do the audit under the vat law so now so there is no such vat audit or any discussion so now the new thing included in your syllabus this was not there in the old rtp hai na ye jo first part maine discuss kiya na types of audits under the gst law this was there in number 18 rtp also okay or it was there in the module also it is included in your syllabus also okay but this is a new entry the preparation for the audit under the gst law okay now look at the level of preparation it says you have to inform the registered person that you know gst audit is applicable to you matlab taiyari yahan se hai ki aapke jo clients hai unko inform karna padega ki are aapko gst audit applicable hai do you understand what does it say inform the concerned assessee or the registered person about the applicability of gst audit then you check your eligibility for doing the gst audit right whether the ca if you are doing the internal audit of the assessee registered person can you do their gst audit and the internal audit of of geo limited can i do the gst audit of geo limited chartered accountant i am internal auditor of geo limited can i do the gst audit of geo limited can i do the tax audit of geo limited no tax audit gst audit both cannot be done by the internal auditor so anyways i have discussed this question so let me just come to one uh, ethics question which has been put in the rtp may 19 right let me come to one rtp question which has been put in may 19 right ethics question rtp may 19 there is a question over there i think the c question right wcp and company llp right question number 24c and a question number 24c right what does it say wcp and company llp are the internal auditors of def limited WCP and company LLP also agreed to undertake GST audit of DAF Limited simultaneously. So they are already the internal auditors. Can they do the GST audit? 
no they cannot be appointed to do the gst audit right so if you come to the answers right if you come to the answers what does it say no particular clause over there but they say the council of the institute while considering the issue are you all with me right whether an internal auditor of an entity can also undertake the gst audit of the same entity as required under the cgst act decided that an internal auditor of an assessee whether working with the organization or independently practicing ca being an individual chartered accountant or a firm of ca cannot be appointed as a tax auditor ye to pehle se hi hai the internal auditor cannot be appointed as the tax auditor upon consideration the council decided that based on the conflict in roles as statutory and internal auditor simultaneously the bar on internal auditor of any entity to accept tax audit will also be applicable to gst audit ye learn karke jao sentence what does it say upon consideration the council decided that based on the conflict in roles as statutory and internal audit simultaneously the bar on internal auditor of any entity to accept tax audit will also be applicable to gst audit so just as internal auditor cannot do tax audit he also cannot be appointed to do the gst audit accordingly an internal auditor of an entity cannot undertake the gst audit of the same entity in the instant case and therefore wcp and company llp will be held guilty for misconduct right therefore will be guilty right one more question i just remembered can a chartered accountant in practice state on his professional documents that he is an insolvency professional this was there in rtp number 18 they have not yet asked a question can a ca in practice mention on his professional documents clause 7 part 1 first schedule advertises his professional attendance or services or uses designation or expression right can he state on his professional documents that he is an insolvency professional yes as it is a title recognized by the central government right can he state that on his professional documents yes can he say is a tax consultant or a management consultant no right but can he state that he is an insolvency professional yes as it is a title recognized by the central government okay so let's again go back to prepare for gst audit you know what are we discussing preparation for the gst audit so first preparation what inform the assessee what is the first preparation that they are saying inform the assessee about the applicability of gst audit and you also confirm your eligibility right that whether you are eligible to do the gst audit because if you are doing your internal audits then you cannot be appointed to do the gst audit right then after that what does it say now koc knowledge of client's business right so applicability eligibility are you all with me Yes, applicability, eligibility, and now KOC. Understand the nature of the business, the product or the services, requirements of records to be maintained, and advise the audit to maintain accounts and records. So it says also inform the client. Can they go GST audit applicable? Are yes, all the records documents left there. So you please maintain all these accounts and records. So understand their nature of operations and also advise the audit to maintain the accounts. Then prepare a questionnaire. right then what is the next point after koc it says prepare a questionnaire to understand the operations right then it says prepare a questionnaire then based on the after the questionnaire prepare a detailed audit program then after the questionnaire you prepare the detailed audit program and then the host of relevant reconciliations right then the host of relevant reconciliation right so short and sweet question could be asked in the exam for 3 to 4 marks Okay, what was seen in one of the mock test paper recently? What had happened? They put thirty marks MCQ, right? Which is going to come in the OCR format. You know, you have to put the circle, circle, right? So thirty marks MCQ is going to come, and remaining seventy marks paper. Okay, seventy marks paper. They've put four, you know, fourteen marks, five questions. You know, fourteen fives are seventy. So life is equally same. You understand? No, five questions out of that question number one is compulsory. And a question number one is compulsory, and then you have two, three, four, five, six out of which you have to write down any four out of five, and in that there are questions of four, four, three, three marks. And so four plus four. Eight and plus six, fourteen. So, वैसे करके fourteen marks. So, पहले वो ही जो आपको you know they used to ask like you know say the objectives of peer review for earlier six marks. 
देन फाइव मार्क्स देन फोर मार्क्स नाउ सेम थिंग विल बी आस फॉर थ्री मार्क्स तो लिखना तो उतना ही पड़ेगा ना जो है ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑफ पीयर रिव्यू वो थोड़ी चेंज होगा Do you understand? No. So it's not. And plus, reading. I am not scaring you, but I am telling you the reality. You understand? You will have to write down the same amount of content for all the case studies. Law of diminishing marginal utility. Earlier, what questions they used to ask for eight marks. Nowadays, same question they ask for four marks. Now four marks are further diminution. Three marks. Okay, so the paper is going to be voluminous, and just one point over here that students sometimes they ask if you've already decided, then no problem. कि क्या करे MCQ पहले करे या बाद में करे? So I'd have I been a student at your place, I would have said पहले करे. है ना पहले क्योंकि एक तो पहले it is objective, so that is a big advantage. Okay, and but don't get stuck up. If you don't know the answer to any MCQ, leave it. कुछ calculation वगैरह आ गया, थोड़ा try करो, नहीं आया, छोड़ दो. Go ahead, but उससे क्या opportunity मिलता है? If you've already read the MCQ one, शायद rest of the paper जो 70 marks है, उसमें कुछ click हो जाए या वहाँ पे कुछ मिल जाए, है ना? So then at least you have an option to go back and do some A, B, C, D. You understand? If you read it only towards the end, then you don't know only ना that analysis, you don't give the time to your brain to think about the options. So I would very मतलब with a very sure shot you know thought analysis for the same I can tell you that MCQs you do in the beginning but don't spend too much of time also over there right don't even spend too much of time over there right say some 40 40 40 minutes around right 40 to 45 minutes should be going for the MCQs and then you come to the remaining part of the paper right so at least you know in that process you've read the MCQs in the beginning of the paper. Right, and this is what I have been thinking of after MCQs have come. That out of thirty, I think you can get fifteen marks in MCQ. You say, Madam, हमने तो पतीस सोच के रखा था. ऐसा नहीं होता है. तुम्हें क्या लगता है कि अब MCQ आ गया तो अब result fifty five percent आएगा? तुम्हें ऐसा लग रहा है कि you've got twenty six days more to study, so result will be thirty percent. No. Okay. See, tw getting 26 days more to study, that happens once in five years. You understand? No. You are in a very lucky attempt right now. You are getting MCQs. Look at the variety. Look at the toppings you are getting. So much of tempting, you know. And you are getting MCQs for the first time. Then on top of that election, government is changing for you. And there is a new government, you know, which will come again and the current government going again, same government, whatever. Okay, so the next government is going to come. So you're going to get 26 days. Okay, and what I have seen, you know, the students, ka, the amount of zeal which was there for the preparation of the subject has mellowed down. Unko lagta bhi aur hai na? 26 days. So bolte, do din to aram kar le. Aray, to zindagi bhar aram kar le na. Abhi to nahi na. You have got incremental benefit of 26 days. So whatever you might, when original institute ke dates came for exam, ke liye, ke the exam will be on 1st of May, 2nd of May, you would have prepared some target that time. And now I'm sure none of you would have been reaching that target because now you know the dates have gone ahead. So I, I know still you're going to struggle for finishing the syllabus only. Whether the exam starts on 27th of May or whether it starts on 2nd of May. Apna story is the same. Hai. Our struggle is the same. So, you know, only those few intelligent, jo thode samajhdaar students hai, unko dhyan mein aayega ki I need to capitalize on this opportunity. What is the incremental benefit? I should have seen two reference books extra. I should have done one revision extra. Phir wo 26 days ka fayda hai na? Otherwise, jo pehle tha, agar ho hi aapka hooga, phir bhi aap fail ho jaoge, to kuch benefit hi nahi hai. Okay, right. So, 15 marks from the MCQ because you're going to do lot of silly mistakes over there. You understand? A mark karoge, phir lagega B hoga. Phir B karoge, phir lagega A hoga. Hai na? CPT days are going to come back. You understand? Na? Phir lagega, aray, yaar, sare A ho raha hai. Bohut dil dukta hai. Malab, motivation. Aaj sa check karte hai, aray, ek bhi CD aaya aapka. You understand? So silly mistakes are going to happen. So I think I should be realistic. You know, in FR, SFM, you get 90-95. Audit, you should get 70-75. Right, no? Okay, right. So you know what I am telling and how difficult it is. 
okay right so around the 15 marks from the mcqs okay then 15 marks you should get from the case studies and you should get from the case studies and the nds question coming in audit paper doesn't look like an audit paper they ask you schedule three disclosures they ask you know regarding the investment company state controlled entity all those questions right then there is a question on fraud then there is a question on going concern there is question on related party nds expert standards and all the different standards they ask the audit procedure as an auditor how would you deal with the situation there is company act question so these are what these are all the case studies so case studies i think you should get somewhere around 15 marks and then from the do or die questions and they ask you mandatory areas of review by audit committee classification of frauds by nbfcs what is the scope of peer review what is the eligibility to be a technical reviewer yes now even quality review applicable okay they ask you the contents of the energy audit report new syllabus they'll ask you contents of the forensic audit report right they ask you what are the areas in which the services of a forensic auditor can be used right they'll ask you what will be the findings in the unit inspection for stock and for debtors Right, these are what do or die question. Either you know it or you don't know it. All these come from the remaining syllabus. And apart from the case studies, all the direct questions which you see in your exam. This time, number 18, old course, they asked write short note on true and fair cost of production. You understand? They asked a question regarding comprehensive audit of public sector enterprises. And you know, in public sector undertaking, there is something called as performance audit in which there is efficiency audit, economy audit and the effectiveness audit. One exam, six mark efficiency audit. And they ask you a retail question, six mark, five mark regarding the efficiency audit. So these are do or die. Either you know it or you don't know it. It's not a case study where you can start as per and then you like an audit or modify opinion in accordance with 705, communicate to TCWG, withdraw from engagement. It doesn't happen over here. In a case study, it will be like this. Do you understand? But that doesn't happen for these. These questions, there is only two possibilities. Either you know, know it or you don't know it. Okay, only writing headings like this or you know just writing the question number. How does the end of the paper look? Question number 5A. Heading is written, two points are written, blank. Next page, question number 5B. Heading, two points are written, blank. You will certainly fail. Well, you are eligible to fail. You are not eligible to pass in that case. And this is because you are not studying. You know, you get drained out in studying standards, ethics, caro only. So obviously it does not mean that that is not to be studied. Obviously it is to be studied. But not at the cost of, you know, ignoring the other chapters. Like bank, insurance, cooperative society, NBFC, PSU, consolidated financial statements, audit committee, corporate governance, liability of auditor, special audit assignments, automated environment, CIS environment, peer review, quality review. You can't ignore these chapters. And I'm telling you, these chapters are more reliable. And eight bar padaliya, once you remember what is told in that chapter, you write it that way in the exam, you will surely get the marks. Case study is more subjective. So I think somewhere around 15 marks you should be getting over there. And then see, an additional edge. Because I have ethics, caro, tax audit ka alag se marking nahi kiya hai. I have not given separate marks, you know, allotted over here. So jo bhi ethics ka question aayega. So normally aapko case study mein 1 out of 4 aata hai. Jaan ethics mein wa 2 out of 4 aayega. You understand? No. So where you have a question on ethics, where you have a question on caro, when you have a question on tax audit or say some standards you have done correctly, and from there you will get extra 5 marks. From there you should get, the finishing touch, you, know, you have done those topics very well. From there you should get more 5 marks. Right? So 15, 15, 15 should be 45 and plus that 5 that will bring it to 50. Right? This is what I think should be your approach. But this approach will work only when you cover the entire syllabus. When you are good at writing case studies, when you are good at doing MCQs and when you have also covered the remaining chapters. And plus ethics, caro, tax audit clauses, you have done them well. And now MCQ, which book to refer, how many MCQs to do? The number, all the number of books which are available in the market, please buy all and tick all. Because there is no end to the amount of practice which you can do for MCQ. 
और एमसीक्यू का कैसा है ना एक बार देख लिया बट ओनली वन डिसिप्लिन आपको चाहिए तो आप छह बुक कर लेना एमसीक्यू का बट आप सिर्फ एक डिसिप्लिन मेंटेन करना कि नेवर टू सी द आंसर बिफोर यू थिंक ऑफ इट ऑन योर ओन फिर तो आपने एक बुक करके भी फायदा नहीं है अगर आप पहले अगर आंसर देखने वाले हो इफ यू गोइंग टू सी दी आंसर इन द बिगिनिंग देन तो यू डोंट इवन डू वन क्वेश्चन ऑन एमसीक्यू But if you have that discipline that you are going to do 20 MCQ, you are going to write A, B, C, D, then you are going to check what is the correct answer. Then you can do any number of books on the MCQ. You understand? And then there are MCQ questions, some which are very simple, some which are very difficult. So which are difficult, which is hatke, जहाँ पे थोड़ा tricky question है, उनको आप आर ना revise again करके mark करके रखो. So that later on when you see it, तुम्हें पता है कि सिर्फ वो वाले MCQ फिर से देखना है। जैसे कोई MCQ होगा जिसमें asked us audit materiality is dealt with in essay, है ना 320, 315, 305, 340. Do you know the answer is 320? अब ये MCQ को फिर से देखने का काम ही नहीं है। You understand? And generally MCQ, why I'm telling refer more books because you know once you study an MCQ और उसको आपने एक बार click कर दिया, crack कर दिया, फिर उसको फिर से देखने में that application of mind is not required. And unless and until if it is tricky or it was doubtful that time, so you are seeing it again. So those you've marked it as up. So every time when you study audit, 15-20 minutes dedicated for MC. And every time that you study audit, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, usse zyada nahi. Kyunki phir baaki bhi to cover karna hai na. Around 20 minutes you do MCQ. And a chapter, a book, aise khatam karo ek ek book. Do you understand that? Okay. Right, so coming to the GST audit. What was I telling you about the GST audit? Preparation for GST audit. They can ask a retail question in the exam. Right, three mark, four mark question. So applicability, eligibility, KOC, questionnaire, program, and then the host of relevant reconciliation. Right, then the host for relevant reconciliation. Then this is already there in the module, but again put over here. Best practices to be adopted for audit under the GST law. Right, some of the best practices to be adopted are raised to 10. Right, some of the best practices to be adopted for audit under the GST law. Right, the evaluation of the internal control with respect is namely GST would indicate the areas to be focused. This could be done by verifying. So it says to adopt the best practices in the GST law, you need to verify the following. One, verify the statutory auditor's report. Second, verify the information system audit report, internal audit report and also design an ICQ. So one, you verify the statutory auditor's report. Second, you verify the information system audit report, internal audit report and you also design an internal control questionnaire. And in that questionnaire, one, there should be three reconciliation. Reconciliation of the books of account, foreign exchange outgo reconciliation and quantitative reconciliation of stock transfer. Are you all with me? Right, three reconciliation. Reconciliation of books of account with the returns, reconciliation of foreign exchange outgo and the quantitative reconciliation of the stock transfer. Then use of generalized audit software to ensure that the risk based audit approach practice is adopted. Then review the gross trial balance for detecting whether income expense has been set off. Then reverse charge mechanism, you review the purchases and expenses and ratio analysis would provide vital clues as to the areas of non-compliance. So if you might have noticed, it is all R over there. Risk based audit, reconciliation of books of account, review of gross trial balance, review of purchases and expenses, reverse charge, reconciliation of foreign exchange outgo, reconciliation of stock transfer and the ratio analysis. So how do I remember that? You have to remember it. GST is equal to SIR and 1S, 3I and 7R. Statutory audit report 1S and 3I internal internal audit report information system audit report and the internal control questionnaire in the 7R 3R reconciliations is it right in the 7R 3R reconciliation and 4R are the others risk based audit review of the gross trial balance reverse charge and also the ratio analysis. Right, so some of the best practices to be adopted for audit under the GST law. <coughs> right, some of the best practices to be adopted for audit under the GST law. 
right so one question i told you special audit under the gst law second question preparation for audit under the gst law third one the best practices to be adopted for the gst audit then they also have given over there the audit approach right they have also given the audit approach under the gst law then accounting standards versus gst say if i am a consignee selling goods on consignment on behalf of the consignor okay what what do i recognize as income only the commission or the entire turnover right i am a consignee who is selling goods on behalf of the consignor when i sell the goods what do i recognize as income the entire turnover or only the commission only the commission but for gst it says the entire turnover would be treated as a part of the agent's turnover right normal financial statements only commission income is shown as the revenue of the agent but under gst such turnover would be treated as a part of the agent's turnover right then after that okay fine when lease income you know when lease rentals are paid for any asset taken on lease right you divide it under two parts liability and the expense the interest component under gst the entire amount would be treated as an expense under gst right so normally what do we do the lease rentals are bifurcated into interest charge and liability whereas under gst the entire amount would be treated as an expense right the entire amount would be treated as an expense right so these are just two examples of accounting standards versus gst okay then computerized environment audit planning preliminary review various returns under the gst right so what are the returns under the gst one the gstr 9 which is required to be filed by the regular tax payers 9a by the composition scheme for those registered persons who opted for the composition scheme under the gst law then gstr 9b which is for the e-commerce operators gstr 9b which is for the e-commerce operators and gstr 9c whose turnover exceeds 2 crore right so gstr 9 all those possessees who are registered under the gst law right regular tax payer then gstr 9a composition scheme gstr 9b e-commerce operators and 9c 2 crore right turnover exceeds 2 crore during the previous year then details required in gstr 9 right the basic details the inward outward supplies the itc then the taxes paid and the particulars of the transaction and the other information we'll see gstr 9c then 9 will be easy to yes it's easy to understand 9 then right so details required in gstr 9 and now we come to the analysis of gstr 9c right now we come to the analysis of form gstr 9c okay now right when you do the audit under the income tax law what is your starting point in your problems profit as per the books of account right you take the profit as per the books of account then you do add less and then you come to profit as per the income tax law like one what we do profit as per the books of account add back depreciation as per the books of account and then reduce depreciation as per the income tax law and then you come to the profit as per the income tax law now similarly under gst law you have to start with the turnover and not the turnover as per the audited financial statements then you have to do the add less and then you will come to the turnover under the gst law okay that is just an outline the turnover as per the financial statements then the add less and then you come to the turnover as per the gst law okay gstr 9c has been divided under two parts part a and part b right part a is regarding the reconciliation right which we are going to discuss part a is regarding the reconciliation right and part b is regarding the certification part b which is regarding the certification right so the auditor ca cma who has done the gst audit he is required to give the certificate right so what i am going to do first i am going to take you to the certification right so this is part a which is the reconciliation statement we will come to that also but before that we will go to the right part b which is regarding the certification right part b which is regarding the certification what does it say we have examined the balance sheet and the profit and loss account income and expenditure for the period the cash flow statement 
so audit you know, this auditor certificate for gst audit you know for gst under the gst law we have examined balance sheet profit and loss and the cash flow statement based on our audit we report that the registered person has maintained the books of account or has not maintained the books of account right so has maintained the books of account records and documents as required under the act rules and notification right so point number 1 we have examined point number 2 whether they have maintained right the books of accounts records and document point number 3a we report the following observation comments discrepancies inconsistencies if in right so we report the following observation comments discrepancies inconsistencies if any we further report that something what we do in company law also under section 143 3 and now whether we have obtained all the information and explanation which to the best of our knowledge and belief were necessary for the purpose of the audit then whether proper books of account as required by law have been kept by the company right and whether balance sheet and profit and loss account are in agreement with the books of account i think you might be knowing this and now information explanation proper books of account and are in agreement with the books of account the documents required to be furnished have been annexed therewith and then the opinion in our opinion and to the best of our information and according to the explanations given to us what does it say the particulars given in the said form number gstr 9c are true and correct why because it is a certification right the particulars given in the said form gstr 9c this is the report the auditor has to issue right the particulars given in the said form gstr 9c are true and correct subject to the following observations qualifications if in right so this is the part b which is regarding the certification now i come to the part a which is regarding the reconciliation right now i come to the part a which is regarding the reconciliation okay right part a what does it start with first four yes 1 2 3 4 over there what is 1 2 3 4 basic details point 1 which is regarding the basic details one financial year so say 17 18 right then you write the 15 digit gst registration number of the ssc right gst in right first two numbers represent the state next 10 numbers represent the pan then after that the number of registrations of the state then the nature of the business and then last one is an alpha or a numeric number which is a check digit right so that is the 15 digit gst registration number then 3a and 3b that is the legal name and the trade name right so legal name like for indigo airlines is interglobe aviation limited and what is their trade name indigo right so 3a 3b legal name trade name if any and are you liable to audit under any act right so say the registered person may be liable to tax audit he may be liable to company audit so are they liable to audit under any act right so that is point 1 basic details what are the basic details financial year registration number legal name trade name and are you liable to audit under any other act part 2 is the reconciliation of the turnover declared in the audited financial statements with the turnover declared in the annual return right so everywhere we compare whatever number comes over here with the number which has been filed in the gstr 9 and whenever there is a difference you have to give the reason right turnover as per the whatever calculations are done under gstr 9c turnover which has already been declared in gstr 9 and then the difference and the reason right so now turn over as per the audited financial statements what is my starting point the annual turnover as per the right turnover as per the audited financial statements right to this i will add okay now you know that as per as9 revenue recognition say at the year end on 31st of march some contracts of the company are in process like generally for software companies right say 30% of the contract has been completed right but 70% is yet to be completed and the billing is to be done the invoice is to be raised when 100% of the contract is completed but as on 31st of march there is an unbilled revenue as on 31st of march there is an unbilled revenue now on this unbilled revenue has gst been paid 
unbilled revenue at the end of the financial year has the gst been paid no invoices only not raised when will it be paid in the next year whenever it is completed and then the invoice will be raised but has it been included in the turnover as per the financial statements has it been included in the turnover as per the financial statements yes so what does it say unbilled revenue at the beginning of the financial year add because that whatever was at the beginning of the financial year for that the gst what is the invoice will be raised in the current year and the gst would be paid so that you need to add an unbilled revenue at the end of the financial year you need to less right so what did i tell you 5b unbilled revenue at the right unbilled revenue at the beginning of the financial year and unbilled revenue they'll ask you questions in the exam no turnover is given as per financial statements calculate the turnover as per the gst law right so unbilled revenue at the beginning of the financial year and an unbilled revenue at the right unbilled revenue at the end of the financial year less then what does it say unadjusted advances next one unadjusted advances at the end of the financial year add why because it's an advance so obviously gst would have already been paid on that in the current year and unadjusted advances at the beginning of the financial year less unadjusted advances at the beginning of the financial year less okay what is the expectation what are they saying over there unbilled revenue of beginning of financial year 5b right unbilled revenue at the beginning of the financial year 5b at the end of the financial year 5h this is serial number 5 clause b clause h right then un unadjusted advances at the end of the financial year 5c unadjusted advances at the end of the financial year 5c and at the beginning of the financial year that is 5i right that is 5i if not possible at least we can remember clause 5 see it's not clause serial number 5 and this clause a b c d under that right so did you understand two adjustments right then when we calculate turnover as per financial statements when we calculate turnover as per financial statements do we reduce trade discount when we calculate turnover as per the financial statements afrf do we reduce trade discount yes under gst you have to add back right and the gst it says it's a part of the turnover trade discounts accounted for in the audited financial statements but which are not permissible under gst act right so 5f what is 5f trade discounts what you need to do add back then any deemed supply right any deemed supply now if this deemed supply is already included in the turnover then no need to add it but if it is not included in the turnover like you know transfer of a capital asset transfer not sale of capital asset obviously it will not be included in turnover but for gst even that is turnover so what does it say any deemed supply even that you need to add back right any deemed supply even that is required to be added back so now pay attention then any credit notes issued after the end of the financial year again add back so five things you need to add back to 5a what is 5a turnover as per the audited financial statements what are the five things which you will add unbilled revenue at the beginning of the financial year unadjusted advances at the end of the financial year deemed supply credit notes and the trade discount right so five things you need to add that is b c d e f right then six things you need to reduce right six things you need to reduce right g h i j k right j k l right so these things you need to reduce g h i j k l one turnover from april to june why why turnover from april to june you need to reduce because the gst law became applicable from 1st of july that is why turnover from april to june you need to reduce 
अनबिल रेवेन्यू एट द एंड ऑफ द फाइनेंशियल ईयर रिड्यूस अनएडजस्टेड एडवांसेस एट द बिगिनिंग ऑफ द फाइनेंशियल ईयर रिड्यूस क्रेडिट नोट्स अकाउंटेड फॉर इन फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट्स बट नॉट परमिसिबल अंडर जीएसटी right so sales return not allowed under gst you need to reduce then adjustment on supply to the scz dta units because they are exempt again that you need to reduce turnover for the period under the composition scheme because composition scheme we will pay the gst separately so that is why from the turnover as per financial statements from where am i reducing these six numbers reducing it from the turnover as per the financial statements so april to june then unbilled revenue at the end of the financial year unadjusted advances at the beginning of the financial year credit notes not permissible under gst supply to the scz units and the turnover under the composition scheme right so six things you need to reduce right so a is turnover then b c d e f is the addition then after f g h i j k l is the deletion and then you have three points which is plus minus it could either be plus or it could be minus right there are some valuation rules under the gst law also right so adjustment and turnover due to the valuation rules under section 50 then adjustment in turnover due to foreign exchange fluctuation that is the next one and the last one adjustment in turnover due to reasons not listed above that is m n o so actually not that difficult how much it looks difficult and a turnover as per the audited financial statement then five addition six deletions and three addition deletion any of the two that will give you the turnover as after the adjustment above then turnover as declared in gstr 9 turnover as declared in gstr 9 which you are filing right and then unreconciled turnover and the reasons for the same right so now let me look into the question for the turnover from april to june are you all with me right now we look into the part which is regarding the turnover from the period april to june right so there is a question which is there in rtp may 19 right both old course and new course read this now how they was the question in terms of serial number 5g of form gstr 9c the turnover included in the audited financial statements from the period april to june shall be declared and deducted from the annual turnover to arrive at the turnover as per the gst law please specify which of the following supplies would form part of the reporting under turnover for april to june right so read so which will you reduce from the turnover as per the audited financial statements r raised to 10 rtp may 19 question and it is only a transitional provision iska agle saal se koi effect nahi hoga hai na 18 19 you'll pay for the whole year 17 18 only that you had to pay for 9 months okay read right question number 19 no right question number 19 rtp may 19 old course goods were manufactured and cleared from the factory on 1st july on sale or approval basis the goods were not approved by the recipient and returned back on the right returned back on 25th of december right when were they returned back on 25th of december right so what does it say yes when were the goods sold right when were the goods cleared from the factory first of june on approval basis and they were not approved so did the sale take place no so no need to reduce it from the turnover since the goods were not approved and returned after the stipulated period of 6 months the value of the set supplies would not be included in the turnover as per the audited financial statement so there is no question of reducing it for the purpose of gst law however as per the proviso since the goods were returned after 6 months from the appointed date this gst would be payable for the tax period december 
so though the transaction originated in the period april to june the turnover will not be reflected under serial number 5g so will it come under 5g april to june no however one may reflect such an adjustment under part 2 serial number 5 clause o adjustment in turnover due to reasons not listed above right so it comes in the balancing figure for reasons not listed above right then next one goods were manufactured and cleared from a factory located in bangalore on 30th of april the goods were cleared to its showroom located in hyderabad and eventually been sold from there for on 30th of august the audit under the gst law will be conducted for the bangalore gsti right so they were sold from the bangalore to yes goods were manufactured and cleared from a factory located in bangalore on 30th april and they were sent to a hyderabad right so this is a branch transfer right and eventually when did the sale take place right was sold from there on 30th of august and the audit is to be conducted for the bangalore gsti right so the said goods are liable to excise duty since the goods have been cleared on 30th of april right the goods would not form a part of turnover as per the financial statement since it is a branch transfer it would stand reflected as branch transfers under state level vat laws since audit has been conducted for the bangalore gstin and since supply has occurred from hyderabad it would not be necessary to make adjustment for april to june so again for this one what does it say no adjustment from april to june and the last one right the telephone bill mobile bill continuous supply of service in the nature of telecommunication service has been provided from 1st to 30th june bill is raised on 3rd july payment is due on 21st of july should the revenue be recognized in the month of june and reduced from turnover or should it form a part of turnover from july to march since the due date for payment is 21st of july the entity recognize the revenue in the month of june right so as revenue has been recognized in the month of june but that time it will be liable to the service tax right june that time it will be liable to service tax what does it say though invoice has been raised in the gst regime service tax is payable since service has been provided during the currency of the finance act okay the date for payment of service tax as per the machinery provision may be 3rd of july but the said service would be liable to service tax because the charge under section 66b gets attracted further as per since if a transaction is liable for service tax then tax would not be payable under the gst law hence the said amount should be deducted as turnover under this serial number for the period april to june right so only the last one what does it say it has to be reduced from the turnover right then there is a point regarding these foreign currency transaction right then there is a point regarding these foreign currency transaction a foreign exchange fluctuation whether any adjustment is required to be made to the turnover this is there in rtp may 19 in the discussion in the amendment part that was in the question bank you know the question which i showed right now april to june now this is in the rtp part amendment part then a pqr limited has exported goods to a company located in usa the value of the goods is 1 lakh dollar The exchange rate on the date of filing the shipping bill is CBSC notified 65, RBI rate 68, and receiving the money, the bank exchange the foreign currency at 70 rupees. So, what would be the turnover as per the financial statement? 68 lakh. What is the turnover as per the one lakh? No, one lakh dollar. So, what is the turnover as per the audited financial statement? 68 lakh. What is the turnover as per the GST law? 65 lakh. So, what you will have to do? Reduce 3 lakh. right the difference in revenue being 3 lakh would have to be reduced from the annual turnover as per the financials to arrive at the turn revenue as per the gstr none right because we would understand no turnover as per audited financial statements plus minus and then you come to the turnover as per the gst law so as per audited financial statements it is 68 lakh so now minus 3 lakh and then it will come to 65 lakh and now what was the rate at which it was booked in the book 68 and what is the money received from the bank 70 so the difference in the amount booked in the accounts and the actual amount received 70 minus 68 2 lakh would be credited to the profit and loss account as forex gain so again this would be a part of your turnover again that you need to reduce it from the turnover for gst yes for the gst right even that would be your income so that income you again need to reduce so 3 lakh also reduced and 2 lakh also reduced 
नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इट से सीबीएसई रेट 65, आरबीआई रेट 68, बट एट द टाइम ऑफ रिसीविंग द मनी 66. सो फर्स्ट इज सेम थ्री लाख टू बी रिड्यूस फ्रॉम द एनुअल टर्न ओवर एंड नाउ वॉट इज द रेट एट विच इट वॉज बुक 68 एंड वॉट इज द रेवेन्यू रिसीव फ्रॉम द बैंक रेट 66. सो टू लाख इज द फॉरेक्स लॉस right would be debited to the profit and loss account as forex loss which again needs to be added from the annual turnover as per the financial statements to arrive at the revenue as per the gst law right so gst are nine so that you need to add back right so forex gain you need to reduce and forex loss you need to add right again r raised to 10 they can ask you a question from this one right they can ask you a question from this one Yes, are you all understanding? Right. So, what is it? Total turnover as per the audited financial statements. Five additions, six deletions, and three plus minus. Right. So, A is what turnover as per the audited financial statements. Then B, C, D, E, F. That is the addition. Then after that, G, H, I, J, K, L. That is the deletion. And then M and O could be plus or minus. One, the valuation rule. Second one, the foreign exchange fluctuation. And third one, reasons not covered above. Right. Then turnover as per after adjustment. Then the turnover as declared in the annual return, the difference and the reason. Right, that is the annual turnover. Now we will come to the taxable turnover. So now from this turnover under the GST law, we will reduce the nil-rated supplies, exempt supplies, the no supplies, and also the non-GST supplies. These four we will reduce, and then we will come to the taxable turnover under the GST law. And then taxable turnover declared in GST R nine, and again the difference and the reason. Right, which are the four which you need to reduce? Right, no supplies, nil rated supplies, exempt supplies, and the non GST supplies. Right, so let us see the examples for those also. Right, let us see the examples for these four adjustments. Right, is supplies taxable at a nil rate of tax? Again, this is there in RTP May nineteenth. Right, supplies taxable at a nil rate of tax. Currently, there are no goods and services under nil rate category. Right, then supplies that are wholly or partially exempted from tax (GST) by way of a notification. Example: milk, water, education, healthcare, service. So, nil rated services, exempted services, supplies. Then non-taxable supplies. Supplies that are not taxable under the GST law, but they are taxable under some other law. Example: alcoholic liquor for the human consumption. Right. So, non-taxable supplies and no supplies. right where it it is not as considered to be a supply under the gst law right neither a supply or of goods nor a supply of services sale of land or completed building right actionable claims other than lottery betting and gambling right what are the examples they have given consultation fees received by the hospital exempted supply diagnostic services provided by the hospital again exempted supply so total turnover as per gst law minus this And a minus the consultation fee, diagnostic services, excess petrol available with the hospital sold to a related party, non-GST supply, and land sold by the hospital again no supply, right? So that you will reduce it from the total turnover as per the GST law, and then you will come at the number of the total taxable turnover under the GST law. So that was total turnover as per GST law minus. No supplies, exempt supplies, nil rated supplies, and the right nil rated and the no supply, right non GST supplies. That will give you the total taxable turnover. Right then, taxable turnover on the basis of taxable turnover. Now reconciliation of tax paid. So now already, what number do we have? Taxable turnover. So depending upon the rate which is applicable. You know, five percent, twelve, eighteen, twenty-eight, three percent, and whether it is CGST, SGST, IGST, and the CES which is payable, right? You will calculate what is the tax which is to be paid as per the taxable turnover which has been calculated above. Then tax paid as per GST are nine, right? So total amount to be paid as per above, and then tax paid as per GST are nine, and again the difference and the reasons. Right again, the difference and the reasons and the additional amount payable but not paid now to be paid through cash. 
right so what was point 1 the basic details are you getting what is point 1 basic details then point b the reconciliation of point 2 the reconciliation of the turnover 3 reconciliation of the tax paid now 4 is going to be the reconciliation of the itc right the reconciliation of the itc right so again the itc as per the audited financial statements then that is which is to be claimed in the current year add which is to be claimed in the subsequent years less ITC as per the financial statements, then that which is to be claimed in the current year add, that which is to be claimed in the subsequent financial years less, that will give you the ITC, right? Then ITC claimed in the annual return, then re difference and the reason, same thing everywhere. You calculate a number, you come, what you say, compare it with the number under GSTR 9, then the difference and the reasons. Right, and then the reconciliation of the ITC declared in the annual return and the ITC availed on the expenses as per the audited financial statement. So now one one item of expenditure has been picked up. I know that purchases what is the value amount of total ITC and which is eligible for ITC avail. Right, so rent, royalty, employee cost, conveyance, bank, entertainment. Right, total amount of ITC availed and ITC claimed in the annual return. Again, the difference and the reasons. And tax payable on the unreconciled ITC. Right, this is all point number four. And then you have the last one auditor's recommend point five the auditor's recommendation on the additional liability due to non reconciliation. Right, so part one basic details. Right, then part two turnover. Part three right regarding the reconciliation of the tax paid part 4 the itc claimed and part 5 the auditor's recommendation on the additional liability due to non reconciliation so the description value this central trials the cgst sgst utgst integrated tax gst and the cess if applicable and it also talks about the input tax credit, the interest, late fee, penalty, any other amount based for supplies not included in annual return, erroneous refund to be paid back, outstanding demands to be settled and others please specify. Right, so though it looks very scary, it's not that scary. You understand? No, you can get an overview. Yes, you can get an overview of what they are talking. Mainly in the exam, I expect a question from the part 2, which is regarding the reconciliation. So, what do you do? You try to remember 5 additions, 6 deletions and the 3 plus minus. Right? You try to remember those points. That all comes under serial number 5. Right? That all comes under the serial number 5. And right now, the, uh, this paper, which document which I have opened over here, this is the original form GSTR 9C. And so what you can do, it's a good idea to study from this original GSTR 9C and then what you can do, read the content over here and see the explanation which is given in RTP May 19. And then you read the content over here, okay, okay, B is what? Unveiled revenue at the beginning of financial year and then they've given some explanation over there that you can go through, right? But this should be your control sheet. Right, it's easy to study from this one and even at the end of this reconciliation, please don't talk. Right, even at the end of this reconciliation, they have given some very simple explanation. A 5A may, what will come? And turnover as per audited financial statements. 5B may, unveiled revenue and the basis of the accrual system. Right, at the end, beginning of the financial year. 5C, value of all advances. 5D, 5E. Right, so here also they have given simple one, no? Right, a more easier explanation of what comes under each of these points. Right, so that is regarding the GST audit, right. So we finished our discussion regarding the tax audit and also the GST audit, okay. Right, so now let us just quickly scan through all the other amendments which are there in the RTP. Right, so if I go to the RTP, it starts with SA 299, right, which is regarding the joint audit. Already number 18, they've asked a question regarding joint audit. Right, the standard has been revised, now called as the joint audit of financial statements. Right, how should the joint auditors divide the work? Mutual discussion, right, division of audit areas and also the common audit areas. And once they have done the division of work, they need to prepare a work allocation document. 
right to avoid any dispute or confusion bit among the joint auditors or to avoid any dispute or confusion between the joint auditors and the client right even though if it is a joint audit there is more than one auditor doing the audit common engagement letter common representation letter common engagement letter to be issued and common representation letter to be obtained and there is one question which we expect in the exam not asked so far as sa 299 the factors to be considered in the development of the joint audit plan right the factors to be considered in the is development of the joint audit plan and these points have been borrowed from sa 300 only and a 300 is regarding planning and audit of financial statements right r raised to 10 sa 299 factors to be considered in the development of the joint audit plan should one member of the engagement team of each of the joint auditors should be involved in preparing the joint audit plan should one member from each of the engagement team from each of the joint audit firm should be involved in preparing the joint audit plan yes and what are the factors to be considered one the reporting objectives and scope one factor to be considered the reporting objectives and scope that why this audit is being performed and what is the scope what is the period what are the financial statements then also the joint auditors need to apply their professional judgment as to which areas significant effort is required to be put by the members of the engagement team risk based audit approach no no putting equal amount of effort for doing audit of all areas so professional judgment which areas significant effort then while preparing the joint audit plan they should also consider the results of the preliminary engagement activities which we undertake as per sa 300 the results of the pea that is the preliminary engagement activities and also the nature timing and extent of the resources required to perform the engagement that how many articles, how many qualifieds, how many newly qualified CAs, how many seniors are required on this assignment. Right? So the nature, timing and extent of the resources required to perform the engagement. Right? Factors to be considered in the development of the joint audit plan. Right? Then what are those areas where the joint auditors are jointly and severally responsible? All time favorite question of the institute. Old course also, new course also, old standard also, in the revised standard also. What are the areas where the joint auditors are jointly and severally responsible? One for work which is not divided. Second, deciding upon the nature, timing and extent of the audit procedure. Execution is the responsibility of the respons respective joint auditor. But deciding upon the nature, timing and extent of the audit procedures. Matter relating to all the joint auditors brought to the attention by one of the joint auditor. Again, jointly and severally responsible. Whether financial statements comply with the requirements of the statute. Where the presentation and disclosure of the financial statements is in accordance with the AFRF. Whose responsibility? Everybody's responsibility. Jointly and severally responsible. Whether the auditor's report issued is in accordance with the standards and the pronouncements and the laws and regulation. Again, jointly and severally responsible. And obtaining information and explanation from the management. Again, for that they are going to be jointly and severally responsible. What are the areas where the joint auditors are jointly and severally responsible? Work which is not divided. Deciding upon the nature, timing and extent of the audit procedures. Then matter relating to all the joint auditors brought to the attention by one of the joint auditors. Then whether financial statements comply with the requirements of the statute. Whether presentation and disclosure of financial statements is in accordance with the AFRF. And whether the audit report is in compliance with the statute or the pronouncements. And obtaining the information and explanations from the management generally the joint auditors agree upon a common report to be issued but in case of differences of opinion among the joint auditors the joint auditor having a different opinion may issue a separate audit report not bound by the views of the 
majority of the joint auditors so the joint auditors having a common opinion will issue a common audit report and the other fellow who is having a different opinion will issue a separate audit report and now the report standard says that you need to make a reference to each other's report in the other matter paragraph that in the common audit report the auditors will make a reference to the separate audit report issued by one of the joint auditor and in the separate audit report the auditor will make a reference to the common audit report issued by the other joint auditors which i think is more sensible and you know, making a reference to each other's report in their report right so that is sa 299 which is regarding the joint audit of the financial statements then you have 720 the auditor's responsibility relating to other information right other information when the standard was the old one never a question asked so we don't know now at least with the revised one whether they'll ask a question in the exam or no right the auditor's responsibilities relating to other information what do you mean by other information contents of the annual report so you know this is the annual report of infosys right contents of the annual report right see these are all the contents of their annual report and this is the index of the annual report and as say ye infosys ka pura annual report hai from this annual report if i remove the audited financial statements and the audit report all the other information which remains in this report is called as the other information right other information means all the information contained in the annual report apart from the financial statements and the auditors report so contents of annual report minus financial statements and audit report is equal to the other information okay so now if you see over here all this is other information right all this which i am showing to you okay even this is other information and you know, some charts have been given by them even this is other information but in this other information i can see some information which is common with the information in the financial statements and a revenue 70522 so as an auditor i don't need to read the other information i only need to check the consistency of the financial information in the other information with the financial information in the financial statements I need to check the consistency. यहाँ पे revenue कितना है? Seventy thousand five twenty two crore. So you know, if I go to their profit and loss account, right? If I go to their profit and loss account, right? Consolidated statement of profit and loss. How much is the revenue over there? Oh, sorry. <coughs> right? Consolidated balance sheet. Consolidated. right profit and loss right consolidated profit and loss and how much is the revenue for the year over there 70522 crore this is what is required to be checked by the in the standard okay now prefer so that is what the standard says auditor you should read and consider the other information preferably auditor when would you read and consider the other information before the date of the audit report so that if there is any inconsistency you it can be corrected now see in financial statements it is 70522 in other information also if it is 7522 amazing you check consistency standard is over say in other information it is 80000 and financial statements it is 7522 first you need to decide which is correct आपको इनकन्सिस्टेंसी मिला नाउ नेक्स्ट यू नीड टू डिसाइड विच इज करेक्ट तो एट्टी थाउजेंड इज करेक्ट तो अब क्या करना पड़ेगा फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट्स को चेंज करना पड़ेगा यहाँ पे इट विल बी एट्टी थाउजेंड सो ऑब्वियसली दिस इज अ मटीरियल मिसस्टेटमेंट वॉट इज एंड वॉट शुड बी वॉट इज सेवेंटी फाइव ट्वेंटी टू वॉट शुड बी एट्टी थाउजेंड सो दैट केस इट इज अ मटीरियल मिसस्टेटमेंट फॉर विच यू विल फॉलो द ऑडिट प्रोसीजर्स एंड डू द रिपोर्टिंग but say other information is not right financial statements is right other information is not correct right other information may it should not have been 80000 it should have been 70522 so in this case it is a material 
इनकन्सिस्टेंसी नॉट मटीरियल मिस स्टेटमेंट ना मिस स्टेटमेंट तो फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट में होता है नाउ दिस इज द मटीरियल इनकन्सिस्टेंसी वॉट विल आई टेल आई विल रिक्वेस्ट द मैनेजमेंट टू क्लियर द इनकन्सिस्टेंसी टू रिमूव द इनकन्सिस्टेंसी If they agree, just ensure that the inconsistency has been done away with. If they don't agree, then you will put a other matter paragraph in your audit report. Ki on the in the other information, it is given eighty thousand, which is not right. And if they don't allow you put it in the other matter paragraph, what you will do? Withdraw from the engagement. Right. So that is the outline of SA seven twenty. Okay. Then seven zero one, though it does not come in the list of the amendment, but that's also an important standard nowadays. Trending, no. it is latest okay 701 communicating key audit matters right key audit matters are those matters that in the auditor's professional judgment were of most significance in the audit of the financial statements for the current period and key audit matters are selected from the matters communicated to tcwg what is not covered in key audit matter scope of this essay it says it is not a substitute for disclosures required in accordance with the afrf it is not a substitute for a modification of opinion it is not a substitute for material uncertainty related to going concern or a separate opinion on individual matters when key audit matters are not to be communicated circumstances when key audit matters will not be communicated law regulation precludes disclosure law regulation precludes disclosure or the adverse consequences of doing so will outweigh the public interest benefits of such communication that means it will do more harm than good yes the adverse consequences of doing so will outweigh the public interest benefits of such communication right so what did i say what is a key audit matter what are not key audit matters when key audit matters are not to be communicated why to communicate key audit matters purpose of communicating key audit matters what is the purpose of communicating key audit matters it enhances the communicative value it assists the intended users in understanding those areas that in the auditor's judgment were of most significance and it also assists the intended users in evaluating the management judgment and also understanding the entity right the 701 you have to do it properly it is a trending standard right now okay only once i think or two times the question has been asked they'll ask lots of question from the standard right sa 701 communicating key audit matters right then 141 3g hai na the ceiling limit for the number of audits not applicable while counting that limit of 20 audits per person you will not count the audits of one person company small company dormant companies private companies having paid up share capital of less than 100 crore but those companies should not have committed a default in filing its financial statements and the annual return then ifc reporting 14333i is it applicable to all companies ifc reporting is whether the company has adequate internal financial controls and the operating effectiveness of such control is it applicable to all companies no not applicable to private companies which are a one person company or a small company or a private company having a turnover of less than 50 crore or having the borrowings of less than 25 crore right this question is also there in the mcq rtp may 19 and now the turnover is 39 crore but borrowing is 39 crore so will ifc reporting be applicable yes because the borrowing is more than 25 crore so which private companies ifc reporting not applicable one person company small company and turnover of less than nahi one person company small company and turnover of less than 50 crore or borrowings of less than 25 crore okay ratification for appointment of auditor now not there and no? ratification for the appointment of the auditor then duty to report on any other matter specified by the cg then the role of the nfra right this is mainly covered in law and no? make recommendations to the central government monitor and enforce the compliance with the accounting and auditing standards and oversee the quality of service of the profession right so one to make the recommendation second to monitor and enforce compliance with accounting and auditing standards and oversee the quality of the service of the profession 
right then now the punishment of the auditor earlier it was only you know shall not be less than 50000 rupees but now what they have said whichever or the remuneration of the auditor whichever is less because auditor made a complaint if my fee is only 20000 rupees then how can i pay a fine of 50000 so they made it 50000 rupees or the remuneration of the auditor whichever is less 140 subsection 2 resignation of the company auditor and you know, within 30 days from the date of resignation the auditor needs to file form ADT3 with company and ROC and in case of a government company also with the CNH and if he fails to file then 50,000 rupees or remuneration of the auditor whichever is less then you have 141.3 in which you have the I disqualification right so not to render certain services section 144 services Earlier it used to say a person neither by himself nor through his subsidiary or his associate or any other form of entity can provide the following nine services. Now what does it say? A person neither directly or indirectly can render any of these services under 144 to company, holding company and the subsidiary company. So earlier it used to say a person neither by himself nor through his subsidiary associate or any form of entity. Now it says a person neither directly or indirectly. Right, then government companies, what does it say? Companies engaged in defense production are exempt from the reporting under AS 17, segment reporting. Right, then the provision of deferred tax AS 22 shall not apply to a government company which is a public financial institution. It will not apply to an NBFC registered under Section 45 IA and engaged in the business of infrastructure finance leasing and not less than 75% of the revenue is generated from such business with government companies. So what is not applicable to them? Deferred tax provision. Right, AS 22. Right, and in AS 12, not applicable. One to the public, yes, not apply to a government company which is a not applicable to a government company which is a public financial institution. Then second, not applicable to a non-banking financial company registered with the RBI and a company engaged in the business of infrastructure finance leasing and more than 75% revenue is with the government company. Right, then they have given the Schedule 3. You know, NBFC is also now Schedule 3 applicable. Right, normal companies, how is their balance sheet bifurcation? Asset side? Asset side, non-current assets and current assets. For NBFCs, it is going to be non-financial and financial. You understand? For normal companies, how do you show? Asset and the, <coughs> right, the assets, non-current assets and the current assets. For NBFCs, it is going to be non-financial and the financial. We'll see more points of that. Right, now IFC over financial reporting is referred to as internal financial controls with reference to financial statements. Right, then the reopening of accounts, they can direct the company to keep for a books longer than a period of 8 years. Right, then what does it say? Right of access by the auditor of a holding company to access the books of account is now also extended to the associates. Right, so the parent company auditor, he can access the books of account of the subsidiary. He can also access the books of accounts of the associate. Then the rotation of company auditor, right, what does it say? Listed companies, always applicable. Unlisted public companies having paid up share capital of more than or equal to 10 crore. Or all private companies having paid up share capital of more than or equal to 50 crore. Earlier it was 20 crore, no? now it is 50 crore. Or all companies having borrowings or deposits of more than or equal to 50 crore. Earlier it was 10, 20, 50, now it is 10, 50, 50. Is that clear? Right, then 147. And a punishment for contravention. If you don't comply with 139 to 146, and a 139 appointment of company auditor, 140 removal of company auditor, any of those, what does it say? Punishment. If an auditor of a company contravenes any of the provisions of section 139, 143 is what? The powers and duties of the company auditor. 144, auditor not to render certain services. 145, auditor to sign the audit report. Then what shall be the punishment? With fine which shall not be less than 25,000 rupees, which may extend to 5 lakh rupees or 4 times the remuneration of the auditor, whichever is less. So, this is hai. 
है ना पहले क्या था ट्वेंटी फाइव थाउजेंड टू फाइव लाख नाउ वॉट डज इट से और फोर टाइम्स द रेमिनेशन ऑफ द ऑडिटर विच एवर इज लेस एंड इफ इट इज वॉट इज इट से नोइंगली इंटेंशनली विथ एन इंटेंशन टू डिसीव द कंपनी then 50000 to 25 lakh rupees or eight times the remuneration of the auditor whichever is less right so 50000 to 25 lakh your four times and here it is eight times the remuneration of the auditor whichever is less right so this four times eight times is a new thing right then convicted then it says also to the pay damages to the creditors of the company also Right, required to pay the damages to the creditors of the company also. Under civil liabilities, now the third exception has been added over there. These two exceptions were already there from before. Right, no person shall be liable if he withdrew his consent before registration of the prospectus or he gave a reasonable public notice after the issue of the prospectus. Now they have added a third one over there. Had reasonable ground to believe, and did up to the time of the issue of the prospectus believe that the he was competent to make it, and the said person has given the consent. You understand? So this is the third exception added to the first one: damages for negligence. Right? Damages for negligence. So, baki pura content wo hi hai. Sirf ek third exception add ho add ho gaya hai. Reasonable ground to believe, and did up to the time of issue of the prospectus believe, and punishment for fraud. Now, now under section 448, what does it say? In any return report, certificate, financial statement, prospectus, document issued under any of the provisions of this Act or the rules made there under, any person makes a statement which is false, knowing it to be false, or omits a material fact, knowing it to be material, shall be liable under section 447. And what is the punishment for fraud under Section 447? It says 10 lakh. Right? What does it say? One how much is the amount of fraud? At least 10 lakh or one percent of the turnover. Right? Whichever is less. Right? If it exceeds that amount, any person who is found guilty of fraud involving an amount of at least 10 lakh or one percent of the turnover, whichever is less. Shall be punishable with imprisonment which shall not be less than six months, which may extend to 10 years. And it shall be liable to fine which shall not be less than the amount of fraud which may extend to three times the amount involved in the fraud. And if it is in public interest, then it says the minimum period of imprisonment would be three years. So what is the important number over there? Ten lakh or one percent of the turnover, whichever is less. If the fraud is above that amount, then what is the punishment? Six months to ten years, and also at least equal to the amount of fraud, which may extend to three times. And if it is in public interest, then is yes, three years. Then, if it is less than that amount, ten lakh or one percent of the turnover, whichever is less. If it is lower than that amount and it does not involve public interest, then such person guilty of fraud shall be punishable for a term which may extend to five years and fifty lakh. Earlier that was twenty five lakh. Now it has been made fifty lakh. Right? So five years or fifty lakh. Right? Five years or fifty lakh or both. Do you understand? Five years or fifty lakh or both. Earlier it was five years or ten lakh. Now it is made five years or fifty lakh or both. Then liabilities under the Income Tax Act. CA cannot represent client before the Income Tax Authorities. Is being dismissed from the government services if he is convicted of an offence under the Income Tax Law. If he has become insolvent, if he is convicted by a court for an offence involving fraud, or if he has been guilty of professional misconduct by ICA. Right, he cannot represent the client before the tax authorities. Right, then two seventy eight. If he induces his client to submit the false documents to the income tax authorities, right, induces his client to submit any documents which are false, right, any account statement declaration relating to income chargeable to tax which is false. If he induces or helps his client. to submit any false documents to the income tax authorities he would have committed an offence right so you know that your boss in office has all types of receipts with him and all types of receipts ready you know for filing the income tax return right so what does it say if he induces or abates abates matlab helps his client 
to file the false documents with the income tax authorities what is the punishment it says willfully attempted to be evaded 2500000 rupees with rigorous imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 6 months which may extend to 7 years and with fine right rule 12a when the client is representing the is when the ca is representing the client before the income assessing officer he gives any false information relating to the client right he gives any false information relating to the client either knows or believes to be false or untrue right so false information to the assessing officer so 288 is what ca not to represent client before tax authorities 278 induces the client to submit false documents to the income tax authority rule 12a he is giving false information regarding the client to the assessing officer right when he is representing the client before the income tax authority and under section 271j if any accountant merchant banker registered valuer furnishes any incorrect information in any report or certificate he has to pay a penalty of 10000 rupees for each such incorrect report or certificate right so furnishes any incorrect information in any report or certificate it says 10000 rupees for each incorrect report or certificate Right, two seventy one J has been lately added. ये पहले से ही थे two eighty eight, two seventy eight, rule twelve A. What has been added is section two seventy one J. Right, SEBI LODR. है ना applicability of LODR regulation. उस list में सिर्फ ये एक add हो गया है security receipts. Which companies need to comply with SEBI LODR? Listed companies, but listed what? Listed any of the following on the stock exchange? है ना सिक्योरिटी स्पेसिफाइड नॉन कन्वर्टेबल डेट सिक्योरिटीज नॉन कन्वर्टेबल रिडीमेबल प्रेफरेंस शेयर परपेचुअल डेट इंस्ट्रूमेंट परपेचुअल नॉन क्यूमुलेटिव प्रेफरेंस शेयर इंडियन डिपॉजिटरी रिसीट सिक्योरिटाइज डेट इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स यूनिट्स इश्यूड बाय म्यूचुअल फंड एनी अदर सिक्योरिटीज एज मे बी स्पेसिफाइड बाय द बोर्ड व्हाट वाज नॉट देयर इन दैट लिस्ट बिफोर security receipts added with effect from september 6 2018 so you know listed entities have to comply with sebi lodr but listed what not only share you know it says non convertible debt securities indian depository receipts securitized debt instrument security receipts units issued by mutual fund or any other securities as may be specified by the board question not asked so far है ना पहले भी नहीं पूछा और अब उसमें थोड़ा सा अमेंडमेंट है एक सिक्योरिटी रिसीट्स राइट सो अगेन देर इज अ पॉसिबिलिटी दैट अ क्वेश्चन कुड बी अप ओके ऑडिट कमिटी अंडर सेक्शन 177 राइट सेक्शन 177 इन द फंक्शंस ऑफ द ऑडिट कमिटी नाउ दे से दे कुड टेक एन ओमनिबस अप्रूवल फॉर रिलेटेड पार्टी ट्रांजैक्शन and sometimes the transaction can be entered without approval but then it is to be ratified by the audit committee within 3 months and it is also voidable at the option of the audit committee in case any transaction involving an amount not exceeding 1 crore is entered into by a director or an officer of the company without obtaining the approval of the audit committee and if it is not ratified within 3 months so it has to be so first you enter into a transaction with related party less than 1 crore and then later it can be approved within 3 months but if it is not approved within 3 months such transaction shall be voidable at the option of the audit committee right and if the transaction is with a related party any loss suffered by the company has to be recovered right these provisions shall not apply to a transaction other than a transaction between wholly and a between a holding company and the wholly owned subsidiary company right so one they talk about the omnibus approval can be taken and second that the transaction entered first less than 1 crore and it has to be ratified within 3 months right so that is section 177 audit committee then audit of nbfcs now this is sitting in the rtp i think for last 4 5 attempts already question has been asked so many times in the exam hai na nbfc audit report directions nbfc audit report directions divided under five parts a b c d and e a part is applicable for all nbfcs we'll see it from here 
A part is applicable for all NBFCs. What the auditor needs to report whether a certificate of registration has been obtained. If it is already registered, then whether it continues to hold a certificate of registration and whether it has complied with the net owned funds requirement, right? Whether the NBFC has complied with the net owned fund requirement. Part A is applicable to all NBFCs. How many parts in the NBFC audit report direction? Five parts, right? NBFC audit report direction. A part applicable to all NBFCs, whether it has obtained a certificate of registration, whether it continues to hold a certificate of registration and whether it has complied with the net owned fund requirement. Then next one, applicable for those NBFCs which are accepting deposits from the public in the exam question has been asked. And when they ask you NBFC audit report for NBFC accepting deposits, you have to write A also and you have to write B also. Why? Because A is applicable for all NBFCs. So even though if they ask you for NBFC accepting deposits, you have to write the A part also and then you write down the B part. That one, whether the deposits are within the limits. Have they exceeded the limits? Then whether the credit rating of the NBFC is in force whether the NBFC has complied with the capital adequacy ratio requirement and the capital to risk asset ratio requirement, whether there is violation of the direction, whether there is any default in the repayment of the deposits, whether it has complied with the liquid asset requirement, then whether it has complied with the prudential norm. Right then and the return on deposits and the return on prudential norm and any branches of NBFCs opened or closed during the year. So all these 12 points is the B part. What is the B part? NBFC accepting deposits. Then C part is for NBFCs not accepting deposits. Even this has been asked as a question in one of your exams. Right, so for NBFCs not accepting deposits, what does it say? Board a resolution. Then in spite of it being a non-deposit accepting NBFC, have they accepted deposits? Have they complied with the prudential norm? Right, capital adequacy ratio, capital to risk asset ratio and pro correctly classified as an NBFC microfinance institution. Right, correctly classified as an NBFC microfinance institution. And D part when no certificate of registration is required to be obtained. Right, and then after that you have the obligations of the auditor to submit an exception report to RBI. Even this has been asked as a question in the exam. Right, so when the answers to any of the above is unfavorable or qualified, A, B, C, D, anything is unfavorable or qualified or in the opinion of the auditor, the company has not complied with the provisions of chapter 3B, NBFC acceptance of public deposit direction, NBFC non-systemically important non-deposit taking company direction and also the deposit accepting direction 2016. Right, so that is the obligations of the auditor to submit an exception report to RBI. Then the format of the financial statements, right, the format for the preparation of the financial statements by the NBFCs. Okay, this one is an important question. Difference between NDAS other than NBFC and NDAS NBFC. Difference between NDAS other than NBFC and NDAS NBFC. One difference have I told you? Other than NBFC, they classify it into current and non-current. NBFC, they classify it into financial and non-financial. Right? Difference between NBFC and other than NBFC. So, other than NBFC, current and non-current. NBFC, financial and non-financial. Right, NBFC, what does it say? Separately disclosed by way of a note, any item of other income or other expenditure which exceeds 1% of the total income. Whereas other and other companies exceeds 1% of the revenue from operations of 10 lakh, whichever is high. So for NBFC, 1% of the total income. It has to be shown as a separate hedge. Then NBFCs are required to separately disclose receivables from the LLPs. 
this is not required for other than nbfc it is required only for the nbfcs that receivables from llps yes when which the director is a partner or a member is required to be shown separately and for other companies oci other comprehensive income is shown in the notes to account for nbfc it has to be shown in the face of the statement of profit and loss nbfcs are also required to disclose items comprising revenue from operations and other comprehensive income on the face of the statement of pnl instead of the part of the notes right so it has to be shown on the face of pnl what the oci rather than showing it in the notes right so this is again a question which is r raised to 10 right so financial non financial rather than current and non current then after that 1% of total income or expense right other expenditure other income to be shown separately receivables from llp to be shown separately and then also other comprehensive income to be shown on the face of the pnl and fiscal loss just the direct tax loss and the gst audit i've already covered and the ethics one that has already been covered in the previous rtps only right the kyc norms for cas in practice and the recent decisions of the ethical standard board right so i think that takes care of all the amendments okay so thank you yes and i wish you all the very best